So welcome everybody. Um, it's great to have you here in person and also those of you joining us live stream. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Very excited to be able to introduce um, our very close colleague um, and collaborator, Dr. Kathleen Brady, who will, who will also be our keynote speaker tomorrow at our Dictions in 2023 conference. So we are delighted to welcome back Dr. Brady, who has been here before, to um, speak with us. She is a distinguished university professor at the Medical University of South Carolina. She's also the director of the South Carolina Clinical and Translational Research Institute and has many other, um, has had many other titles at MUSC as well. But she is a very experienced clinical and translational researcher, has been conducting scientific investigations and clinical work in the field of addiction and psychiatric disorders for more than 30 years. Her research focuses on pharmacotherapy of substance use disorders, comorbidity of psychiatric disorders and addiction, gender differences and women's issues in addiction, and the neurobiologic connections between stress and addiction. She has received many, many federal research grants. She's published more than 400 peer-reviewed journal articles and co-edited 10 books. She's the principal investigator of Medical University of MUSC's Clinical and Translational Science Award, the CTSA, and principal investigator of the Southern Consortium Node of the NIDA Funded Clinical Trials Network, or the CTN, and also the director of MUSC's Women's Research Center. She has been a person dedicated to furthering research careers and has attracted numerous junior investigators and clinicians through many years. She's the former vice president for research at MUSC and has served at the president of the served as the president of the Association for Amer Medical Education and Research in Substance Use Disorders, or MRSA, and also is the former president of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry and the immediate past president of the International Society of Addiction Medicine. And so we're just delighted to welcome Dr. Brady, and she will be talking about gender differences in substance use disorders. Welcome. Thank you so much, Shelley, for the invitation. And it's lovely to be here with where I have so many wonderful colleagues. And I have to say, I'm a little self-conscious talking about this topic in front of Shelley, who is really one of the world's experts when it comes to women's health and gender differences in substance use disorders. So I'm going to give her her due right now. And you'll see I'm going to be quoting a lot of, uh, I'm citing a lot, showing a lot of her work along with some of our work. Um, so, oops, let me see if I can, okay. I just want to, I will name my colleagues by name when I'm talking about their work, but I really do need to thank colleagues, so many trainees, and um, all of our work that I'll show on here has been funded by NIH. Um, but I am a consultant to a few pharmaceutical companies and one treatment center, Skyland Trail. Um, and just to give you an overview of how things are going to go today, I'll start with the epidemiology, just what are the, in the United States, because it really does differ, differ by culture and country, um, psychiatric comorbidity, neurobiology, and then talk about treatment, both pharmacotherapy and what we know about gender differences there, as well as some psychotherapeutic treatment options. If we look at gender differences, this is from the National um, Survey on Drug Use, the National Household Survey uh, 2021. And what you can see is if you just look at binge use, it's about three to two. Women, men are the dark colored bars, women are the light, lighter colored bars. Um, but when you talk about heavy alcohol use, that really is proxy for um, alcohol use disorder, um, alcohol dependence. You can see it's about two to one. And that is a, that number sort of goes, as, in spite of the fact that I said, it goes across Western cultures. If you look at your numbers in Europe, uh, numbers in, in Russia, um, you'll see pretty much two to one uh, men to women in alcohol dependence. Cigarette use, much closer. It's almost one-to-one, -one, but if you talk about tobacco products, again, we're back in that three-to-two uh, type ratio because there's chewing tobacco and all kinds of cigars and things that men are more likely to use than women. If we look at illicit drug use kind of across the board, it's about, again, the gender differential narrows for illicit drug use compared to alcohol, 
And it's really about, again, three to two, you know, that, but it's higher for the most part in men than women, but the gender differential is much more uh, narrow. Um, but this is where we really see um, things coming, getting much more even, and that is when we talk about gender differences is in opioid and other prescription drug misuse. And you can see across the board, we're much closer to a one-to-one -one ratio. And this is uh, misuse of opioids and um, things like benzos, tranquilizer stimulants. And women are more likely to be prescribed most of these drugs. Opioids, are women were more likely to come into primary care with a complaint of pain, more likely to be prescribed benzodiazepines as well. So it's not that surprising to see that when it comes to problems with these use, the use of these drugs would often start as a prescription, a legitimate prescription. Uh, men and women are much closer to equal. Um, opioid use is an, a particular problem for women. I think we're finally um, um, getting hold of at least the gender differential has narrowed. I'll show you some very recent statistics. But women are just much more likely to be prescribed opioids than men, and they're more likely to use them for longer periods of time. So when the opioid epidemic reared its ugly head, and uh, you know, really a lot of these deaths have been caused by you know primary care. Lots of doctors just cut people off abruptly, and people began to turn to illicit sources. People who were dependent on substance uh, on opioids began to turn to illicit sources, and that's where we got into fentanyl. A lot of the overdose now is fentanyl, sufentanyl. These really powerful um, um, synthetic opioids, and so women got into big trouble with that, and you can see that since nine, 1999, uh, opioid overdose deaths have increased almost twice as much in women as men. Uh, heroin use increased 100% in uh, women versus 50% in men. Um, and a big increase in synthetic, like a thousand times increase in, in synthetic opioid-related deaths in uh, women more than in men. And then, of course, perinatal opioid use and neonatal withdrawal um, also increasing. And I just have to put in that really COVID-19 has done not, has not been any help when, at all when it comes to the addictions. If you think about it, this, this slide isn't really updated, but this was just South Carolina um, response responses to uh, suspected opioid overdose deaths in early 2020 it, with the epidemic look compared to 2019. Numbers just skyrocketed. And really, what we have with people with addictions, this is definitely a, marginal, a marginalized population. And a lot of this stuff is even worse for women than men. Um, housing instability became even worse during the pandemic. Certainly job loss, and it was especially those frontline workers, people working in sanitation, people working in restaurants. Again, jobs that women are often more likely to have. So job loss, domestic violence really skyrocketed. Everybody home with their spouses. Um, and certainly social isolation, which can, can be a precipitant or worsen drug use. Uh, also, people with addictions are more vulnerable to the medical consequences of, of uh, COVID, you know, because of their immune system and other things being compromised by their drug use. And the systems for providing care became very fragmented. So COVID really, I think, worsened a, a lot of things about uh, drug addiction. And it's really shown in this, this is is the uh, opioid overdose deaths by gender, and just take a look at 2019 to 2021, up for both men and women considerably up, and most of that really is synthetic um, uh, opioid, fentanyl, and other things overdose. So why don't we move on to talk about com comorbidity. In terms of co-occurring psychiatric disorders, women are two to three times more likely to have depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, and PTSD. And I'm going to sort of go off after this and talk a lot more about PTSD and the stress addiction connection, because that's really where our group has gotten very interested. Men are more likely to have antisocial, men with substance use disorders, more likely to have antisocial personality disorder, more likely to have polysubstance, alcohol and drug, and more likely to have ADHD. Men and women are equally likely to have bipolar disorder and substance use. And just looking at this graphically, this is, again, old data, National Comorbidity Survey, but um, the numbers, even from the most recent study, Bridget Grants, look about the same. This is lifetime alcohol dependence, 
on, on the left side here, or I guess it's your right side, we're looking at men, right side looking at women, and you can see women are twice as likely, and really for anxiety and affective disorders, they're more, uh, they're more likely to have it if you're alcohol dependent than they are to not have it. So this is something that's just, it's a really important point. We really need to look for and treat these um, treatable psychiatric disorders when people um, with substance use disorders have comorbidity, men and women. Um, so one thing that there's a gender difference in is which came first? Is it the drug or alcohol use disorder or is it the, um, um, the psychiatric disorder? And again, this is old data from the Kessler et al. The, uh, Nash, this was the ECA study. And what they did was just ask men and women with affective disorders and anxiety disorders it, of your mental health disorder versus your, your um, substance use, which came first. And you can see that for both, aff especially for affective, but, but for both affective and anxiety, women are much more likely to say, I had my symptoms of my mood or anxiety disorder before I started using substances. We kind of redid this study with a large group of p people we had entering studies for PTSD. And here we're looking at, we asked them which came first, we asked them what the, the seminal event was that where their PTSD originated and then asked them for their first signs of um, where the first time they met criteria for a substance use disorder. And again, you can see big difference between men and women in the blue, men in the green, and um, women were much more likely to report their PTSD symptoms before either their symptoms of alcohol or cocaine dependence. And what this really amounted to was many, many women reporting early childhood experiences and childhood histories of abuse and neglect and trauma. And so this relationship between childhood adversity and addiction is strong for men and women. And I'm going to show you some data from the uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which has been widely published, but um, violence and trauma is common in the lives of individuals with addictions anyway, no matter what. And you might say, well, of course, they're at bars, you know, with money hanging out of their pocket. They're walking down an alleyway. They put themselves in unsafe situations. But the fact of the matter is early childhood, before they could even have been um, exposed to, before they started using, um, you, you hear lots about violence and trauma. Uh, women are more likely to experience childhood abuse in general than men, but in particular, they're more likely to experience childhood sexual abuse. And there is a strong relationship between um, abuse and the development. In fact, in the ACE study, and I'm going to show you some data that right now, in the ACE study, they, this probably has been more published than anything except maybe the Framingham study. They have looked at high ACEs, which are these adverse childhood events, and how they relate to everything from obesity to myocardial infarction to metabolic syndrome to suicide and drug and alcohol use. And the strongest relationship of all is between having a high, high ACE scores and the development of drug and alcohol use disorders. That is the one that stands out. And right here, we're looking at ACE scores. The, what's the, the odds ratio? Um, uh, of the ACE scores and the drug initiation before the age of 14, and you can see huge uh, risk once you get up to um, a certain value in the ACE scores, and this is ever addicted. And in fact, they found when they did some sort of crazy analysis that I'm not sure I can explain that the ACE accounted for um, one half to two thirds of the individual's problems with um, substance use disorders. We, again, uh, recently just took, just so, sort of reiterating, taking a, a look again at what kind of childhood experiences people were reporting and what you can see, and comparing men and women, this is across um, uh, cannabis, cocaine, opioid, and tobacco use disorders. As you can see, women were one and a half times more likely to report emotional abuse. About the same for household dysfunction. This is the big one, though, sexual abuse. Four times as likely to report uh, childhood sexual abuse, and two and a half times as likely to report neglect in childhood. Sexual abuse is what, you know, different different um, traumas certainly have a, have a different valence for producing sort of ongoing sequelae and sexual abuse, for sure. What, the, probably the only thing that tops 
uh, sexual abuse in terms of the, the percent of people that experience that go on to develop PTSD is being kidnapped. So if you're kidnapped and held for a, you know longer than a 24-hour period, you've, you've got a pretty good chance of developing PTSD. And sexual abuse comes right behind that in terms of the um, how commonly people will develop PTSD or some other bad sequelae. Um, but these, not only does the childhood trauma stick with people, make them more likely to develop a substance use disorder, but in this study, we're looking here at probability of survival. In fact, I think this was done right here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we're looking at survival. This is women, this is men. Uh, the dotted line is hot, people with high emotional abuse, history of, clear line is low emotional abuse. So what you can see is for women, High emotional abuse is associated with a much shorter time to relapse. For men, it doesn't seem to make quite as much difference, but for women, you can see that this, uh, their childhood trauma is, is predictive of their outcomes. Um, and so we started, I'm just going to talk a little bit, just give you a little snippet of work that we've been doing in the center that's been ongoing for almost 20 years now. We are really studying the stress addiction connection. And we do a lot of human laboratory stuff that I'll describe. But one of the things that we found in our human laboratory studies that when, when we showed negative emotional cues um, as compared to cues that were associated with the drugs that people use, women's craving was much greater to these negative emotional cues. And often it was like a personal scenario of a fight they had or um, something like that. Um, women much more often report stress and interpersonal conflict as a precipitant of their relapse. And men appeared to be much more responsive to the drug-related cues in terms of craving and that sort of thing. So we're slaving away in the human laboratory doing this, and then comes this beautiful study by Mark Potenza at Yale. And basically what he does, he's done is, this is uh, fMRI, and they've got cocaine-dependent men and women compared to control men and women. And what they do is take them into the scanner, and on this top bar, they, oh, sorry, I just did my, I'm, let me make sure I go back here. In the top bar, uh, uh, the top one, they're, they're looking at stress-related cues. And look at what lights up in these women. And again, this was a, uh, they were being read back a interpersonal stressful situation that they had described to the researchers. All of these limbic areas that we know are associated with drug use and with the craving for drug use light up when these women in the scanner, the cocaine-dependent women, this is what lights up more in the cocaine-dependent women than the controls. For men, eh, a little bit, but really not much. If you show them drug cues in the scanner for women, there's just about nothing. That's hard to even imagine, but not much activated. But um, look at the drug cue for the men. So again, this idea, this is sort of biologic verification of the fact that women are much more, re the cocaine dependent women are much more responsive to stress and interpersonal stress situations and report craving. This is what draw, can, can drive relapse for these folks. So we have had this P50 funded by the Office of Research in Women's Health and NIDA. And um, what we've been looking at really over the years, we focus on gender differences in addiction, but in particular, um, we honed in fairly quickly on the relationship between stress and substance use disorders and gender differences in that, in that relationship. We decided, you know, there's, if we wanted to look at the neurobiology of it, we had to look at something that you could measure. And we do do some scanning now, but in the beginning, we really were focused on human laboratory studies where we were looking at the end product of the HPA axis, which you guys all know very well. In response to stress, CRF is released, goes to the pituitary, where from the anterior pituitary, ACTH is released. Posterior pituitary, actually, oxytocin is released at the same time, so it's sort of the yin and the yang of the stress response, and we've done some work with oxytocin. Then to the adrenals, where cortisol is released from the adrenal cortex. The adrenal medulla, again, I know this is repetition for you guys, but just to, just to remind you, from the adrenal medulla, you get norepinephrine and epinephrine, but that release is actually prompted really much more from stimulation from the locus ceruleus. And so cortisol peaks at about 20 minutes after a stressor. Epi and norepi 
peak like one minute after the stressor. So this one right here, locus ceruleus to adrenal medulla is much faster. And in fact, this is exquisitely controlled um, with feedback loops. And one of the things that happens with, with cortisol, 20 minutes out after the stressor, you probably don't still want to be acting like there is a, a frightening line right in front of you. By that time, your epi and norepi is up and you've run away and maybe it's time to calm down. And that's part of what cortisol does is help to shut down it's part of it's, it's one of the hormones that sort of shuts down this feedback loop and gets the uh, body back to homeostasis so we bring people into the lab we usually bring in um, substance using we've actually done this with alcohol cocaine um, opiates um, uh, marijuana and I'm just going to show you a few slides because this could it could get really boring. We expose them. That we've done a number of different exposures, either psychological exposure to the tree air, um, physical. We've done some cold pressure work, and then we've done pharmacologic probes like uh, CRF or yohimbine. And then we measure a lot of stuff. We measure uh, epi, norepi. We measure H, you know. Uh, ACTH and cortisol, and we follow them for a couple of um, weeks out to see if they, if and when they relapse, because we want to know, is there anything, do those who had the weirdest response or the most abnormal response in the laboratory, do they relapse more quickly? Is this, is this predictive of, of anything, or are we just looking at some sort of an epiphenomenon? So I just want to show you, this is one of our earlier studies with cocaine dependence. We gave people CRH. In this, and you know, ACTH and cortisol in a well in a well functioning um, uh, HPA axis, you should see a nice relationship because ACH, ACTH stimulates the release of cortisol, sort of like that. This is cortisol. That this is cortisol ACTH. So for cocaine control males and control females, it's it's much more highly correlated. Cocaine dependent men, it begins to fall apart. Cocaine dependent. Females, there's absolutely no relationship between ACTH and cortisol. In fact, their cortisol release is, is really quite low. Um, their subjective response is very high. Their cortisol release is very low. Um, so we also looked at their heart rate. And what you can see here is this is the cocaine-dependent women. This is the control women. These are the... Um, uh, uh, control males and cocaine dependent males. So for our cocaine dependent females, heart rate goes up higher and it stays up. That's probably really the most pathologic part of this is we're talking 120 minutes out and it is still um, far above the normal range. So they have a, a more precipitous stress response and it does not um, return to normal in a timely manner. We have gone on, again, as I said, we've got some data on uh, alcohol and cannabis and tobacco, but I just wanted to show some of our newest data on opioids. In this study, we did the Trier test, test and then followed it by a drug Q, thinking that they would, um, uh, there'd be additive effects. There weren't additive effects, but what we did find in terms of gender differences, so subjective stress, this is our, um, our females, this is our males, but cortisol response, this is our females, this is our males. So their subjective stress is high, but their cortisol response is low. Their physiologic response is low. Yet, um, once again, heart rate, um, this slide's a little wonky because we're looking at the tree air, then the Q, but if, if we just look out here in, in terms of who's Heart, go, heart rate goes up and stays up again. This is our um, cocaine, our, our opioid-dependent females. Same, same sort of pattern. The heart rate goes up and stays up. What this made us think about is that it's probably not cortisol or ACTH, not the HPA axis, that's um, causing this. This has got to be noradrenergic because it happens immediately after at its heart rate after all um, but also it's not shut down because the cortisol is not coming back around to so those were two sort of hints we got from this that we thought would help us in terms of uh, therapeutic development so our conclusions overall from both and i didn't show you we have a really nice translational center we have um, 
Um, we always fund two clinical and two basic studies. We do, because we're working with things like noradrenergic agents, we can use the same things that the people can use in the lab, which is pretty amazing. Um, and, and they have really, we've really gone back and forth a lot with all of these findings. We've really been able to um, replicate them. Either they did them first and then we replicated, but we've also had some cross-translation. They were the, we, sh we said, we think there's a gender difference in response to CRF. So, you know, it took us two to three years to find that out. They go, in, in our cocaine-dependent um, women, they went back to the lab, and in about two days, they had a full dose response curve showing um, that the female rats were more responsive in terms of their stress response to uh, CRH. Um, but we have both animal and laboratory studies that show us alcohol, nicotine, opiate, and cocaine-dependent females have more HPA axis dysregulation and or CRH sensitivity compared to males, and they have greater noradrenergic sensitivity. What I didn't show you is we've got stud gotten studies where we've given yohimbine, which is an alpha, it, 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 it juices up the alpha system, and then we've given alpha blockade and shown that that's more powerful in women than men. Um, and in human studies, this dis dysregulation is associated with greater relapse. So if we look at those people that had the greatest dysregulation, the greatest disconnect between subjective response and um, their physiologic response, so high heart rate, low cortisol, those are the people that were more likely to relapse. So again, we think this has some functional meaning. So let me just, and I'm gonna go on to talk a little bit about some treatments that have been developed based on some of this. But um, first thing I want to do is I'm going to be quoting here an article that was written by uh, Amy McRae from My Place and Sherry McKee. They did a very nice review of gender differences in terms of medications that we use to treat addictions. And probably one of the first and most profound statements that they made that they reiterated throughout the article, this is a completely under investigated area, that there's hardly any studies. First of all, most of the early studies in substance, medications for substance use disorders were done in men only. Um, then when they started adding women, there were really very few and, all, and, very, and, and really very, uh, not enough to make a comparison. Lately, there's more women in studies, but usually they're not powered for, to do a gender difference analysis. They're powered just to, to, to find a difference difference. But I'd have to say wherever there are studies that have been powered to find differences and where they look at differences, they've found them. And one of the areas where that's seen most profoundly is in smoking cessation. There are clear differences in the medica in gender differences in response to the medications that we use to treat smoking cessation. And these are the only studies that have actually been powered for a head-to-head -head comparison between men and women. There really aren't any, any other studies that have looked at that. But In a meta-analysis done a few years ago, they found that across smoking cessation trials, um, pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy, women were less likely to attain abstinence. Women are less responsive to nicotine replacement therapy, and I'll show you uh, some data in that. And we, we know that there's gender differences in that there's upregulation of nicotinic receptors following cessation um, in men, and it's much greater than it is in women. So this might explain why nicotine replacement therapy works for men and not so much for women. Bupropion is equally efficacious in men and women, and varenicline is probably the one you want to choose if you're try trying to help a woman stop smoking because it is more efficacious in women than men and is probably the most efficacious. We're looking here, um, this is, as you can see men, these are trials, varenicline versus nicotine, varenicline ver versus bup, and nicotine versus bup, bu uh, bupropion. And what you can see is, for men, there's no difference across these trials, this is odds ratio, but for females, varenicline definitely beats out nicotine replacement, definitely beats out uh, bupropion, and then there's just not much difference, not so much between nicotine replacement. So it, in the studies where we've done head-to-head -head comparisons, we've definitely shown differences. So now I'll go on to sort of the more disappointing areas where people really haven't looked for gender differences. In naltrexone, we have seen a number of studies that there's more side effects in women as compared to men, more nausea, more sleep disturbance. There is one study in baclofen, which is a GABA-B, agonist, right? 
Um, large study in alcohol dependence, women were 11 times more likely to achieve abstinence. And that has never been followed up. I'm not sure if there, if there is a follow-up or why that might be. For opioids, there actually have been several meta-analyses that suggest that women respond better to buprenorphine than to methadone, um, and that they respond better to buprenorphine than men do. So uh, again, another, another finding with some clear um, clinical implications. Um, but what we've gotten very interested in is this gender differences in response to adrenergic agents. And adrenergic agents, again, it's a very simple system that we're talking about here, but um, they, and drugs, some of these drugs are really old, they've been around for a long time, but adrenergic agents are approved for the treatment of opioid withdrawal. I mean, you want to turn down the tone of the adrenergic system. Um, so clonidine and lofexidine is the latest. These are alpha-2 um, agonists, but basically they ask presynaptically to decrease the flow of epi and norepinephrine. There are actually second-line drugs, both clonidine and guanfacine have been shown to have these, again, alpha-2 blockade, um, uh, or alpha-2 agonists, and, and decrease the noradrenergic tone. Um, they're useful in smoking cessation, both have approval. Um, they have been explored in cocaine dependence. I'll show you one slide of, uh, um, from the Yale group looking at guanfacine. And they may be particularly useful in stress-related relapse, which is especially important for women. And I'll show you a little bit of data that suggests that. But this is an, a la human laboratory study done by Helen Fox, who's now at Stony Brook. And this is males and females given placebo, the clear, versus guanfacine, the stripe bar. And what you can see is that, and this is craving across a couple of different imagery conditions. For males, guanfacine doesn't, not only does it not block it, it might even make it worse, but for females, we have a significant difference of guanfacine in decreasing uh, cocaine um, craving to, to uh, both emotional and um, uh, cocaine-related imagery. And this is another very interesting study. This is done by the NIDA intramural program, Kinsey Preston, published a couple of years ago in the American Journal. And what they did, they had a group of people on either buprenorphine or methadone, opiate-dependent people on some sort of a medication-assisted treatment. And they added clonidine, which you might just add for withdrawal, but in this case, they kept them on clonidine throughout this 12-week period. And the clonidine is the... Uh, green bar. And this is, a, again, a survival analysis of the people without relapse. And you can see clonidine actually prevented relapse more than placebo. And they also, what they did that was so interesting, they did ecologic momentary assessment. So they had people with cell phones and they'd ask them repeatedly throughout the day, are you stressed? Are you, uh, are you craving? And what they found was that this effect is probably due to the fact that these people had less stress-induced craving. That was the one area they reported less stress and less of a response to stress in their EMA recordings. So, of course, we went back and asked them, could they do a gender analysis? And they had about five women in this study of 120 people. So um, we are now looking at this. We've got a group uh, in our one of our center grant um, um, studies is lofexidine added to buprenorphine in men and adequately powered um, to look at gender differences, men and women. Again, we're using EMA to um, see if there's a particular um, impact on stress-induced relapse. So um, two, next time I come, I'll hopefully have some results from that. But what about other non-pharmacotherapies? Well, one of the things we know is that women, this is a very recent study, something we all kind of already knew, but women are much less likely to seek substance use treatment due to stigma and logistics. And this uh, study, they looked at data from the National Household Survey in 2019. They found that 11% of the women with substance use disorders had actually received treatment in 2019. Um, and the number for men is about 20 to 25%. So that's a significant difference between men and women. So they then went back and sampled 400, 400 or 500 of those women in a survey type study and asked them, why didn't you seek treatment? Well, like a lot of people with substance abuse treatment that don't 
seek treatment, a lot of them say, I don't have a problem or I was not ready for treatment. So that's, that's 71% um, said they weren't ready for treatment. Those in that group that said they weren't ready were more likely to be unemployed and in general had lower education. But a good, you know, almost 30% said the reason they didn't seek treatment had to do with logistics and with stigma. This group, by and large, was higher educated. They were more likely to be employed. They were worried about losing their job. They were worried about negative opinions. Uh, a lot of single mothers were in this group that said they just couldn't figure out the, uh, the logistics of seeking treatment. So the fact is, that, that the fact of the matter is women do seek treatment less likely even when they even than men even when they know they need it and so Connie Gill who's a, a one of my colleagues who's uh, uh, was you know was a K awardee with me but now has gone on to do so many great things I'm so proud she developed this treatment she actually works mostly with um, pregnant women pregnant and postpartum women so this initial study was done in pregnant women but she's now got a PCORI grant to sort of extend it to um, men and women in primary care everywhere but basically she would say what are the barriers to successful treatment and screening on, a, on the patient level we just heard there's stigma there's fear especially for women in South Carolina of social and legal consequences we're one of the few states that's actually put women in jail for substance use during pregnancy. Um, lack of access to resources, lack of access to providers, transportation, et cetera. From the provider perspective, talking about primary care here, often they say there, it, there's not time for screening. Even if they did the screening, they wouldn't really know what to do. They don't want to get stuck with this problem on their hands that, you know, now I know somebody's got a substance use, especially if it's a pregnant woman, uh, what am I going to do? Um, and then the healthcare system, they, you know, they often won't push screening because of cost and, you know, training. You train one group and then there's turnover. So what Connie thought it would be worth doing is develop developing this system, it's called Listening to Women, and it's a text message based screening. And so what happens is people come in for their uh, prenatal visit, um, they get a brief, this, in this study they're comparing a brief intervention done in the clinic to um, them giving permission, permission to be texted a, screen, a, brief, a brief intervention, a screening, a, texted a screening, and then if that screening is positive, they get a phone call from a social worker. And then um, if that, that social worker talks to them, sees if there's problems, and makes a referral to treatment, but that, that social worker says, you know, uh, is transportation a problem? So the treatment might be telemedicine, or it might be a home visit, or it might be referring them to treatment somewhere, but it's sort of personalized for that person's situation. And then they communicate back, they sort of complete the circle, they communicate with OB and PEDS about what's going on. They also communicate with the treatment setting. And these are her results. So the, the um, lighter blue bar is standard of care, that's in-house in, uh, um, in screening. The blue bar is listening to women. So this is the percent screened. You can see there's a significantly higher percent that actually get the screening. Um, this is the percent that report a positive screen. So you can see there's something about doing it, um, you know, via text messaging. People were much more likely, this is, this is pregnant women too, especially, so much more likely to actually probably be honest about it. This is the percent that were referred to treatment, and this is the percent that received treatment. You can see much, much larger in this text in this listening to women program. So as I said, Connie's had a lot of success with this. She now has a PCORI grant to do pregnant women all over the country, but then a, another PCORI to look at primary care in not pregnant people, just regular people. So the next area in terms of treatment, again, th th a lot of this treatment is for both men and women, because PTSD certainly affects men and women, but I put it in this talk because PTSD and substance use disorders are more common in women than they are in men. So it's, an, it's important that we know about the treatments if we're going to um, uh, treat people appropriately. So there's always been a controversy in the field about whether you should do, um, uh, if somebody's got both PTSD and a substance use disorder, these, um, um, 
the, the sort of trauma or exposure-based therapy or trauma-focused therapy is where you bring the clients in or the patients in your office and in office, you have them talk about sort of relive the trauma um, and they do it in a safe setting and basically you're able to sort of remove some of the emotion from the trauma. You, they're able to finally realize, hey, I don't have to be scared every time I you know, see a black car just because I was raped in a black car, that doesn't, the, the car, so you're able to actually allow them to remove some emotion from things that were previously innocuous that they have been, um, that they've been afraid of ever since the trauma. Non-exposure based therapy is a cognitive behavioral techniques that actually are, again, are very useful. Um, they help support new thought patterns, support safety and recovery, but you do not bring the trauma up in great detail. And so, uh, for a long time, everybody thought you can't do exposure or trauma-focused therapy in people with substance use disorder. You will precipitate relapse. It's you know, it's a it's an absolute no-no. So um, there's been this is probably one of the areas that's gotten more study than any other comorbidity. Depression, maybe depression has gotten more, but in any case, um, there. Um, it was a project done by Denise Yen, who I know has spoken here in recent years, where she looked at um, 36 studies, 4,000 across studies that both alcohol use disorder, um, drug use disorder, trauma-focused therapy, non-trauma-focused therapy, to see what seemed most efficacious. And what they found was that um, there are several effective treatment options for patients who have both PTSD and substance use disorders, but trauma-focused therapy combined with pharmacotherapy for alcohol use disorder really had the largest comparative effect size compared to treatments as usual. And trauma-focused treatments had large effect sizes in general and re re really um, resulted in more reductions in both PTSD and substance use symptoms. Um, again, what she says and what I think is very true, some people, even though I'm a proponent of trauma-focused therapy, and I'm going to talk about one that we've developed and um, studied at MUSC, I think there are some patients that aren't ready for them. So I think there is a place for non-trauma-focused therapy as well. But I think there's no question, if you look at in the treatment of PTSD, the IOM has done a big study of which psychotherapies are most effective, and they definitely, they, the only one they gave the number one um, rating to was, a, was exposure-based therapy. So uh, to us, it seemed like a shame to withhold that from this very um, sick and with patients that often dropped out of treatment. So we developed, it, I, it was, um, I initiated along with Sudi Back, Kathy Carroll, who was a wonderful collaborator of all of ours, and Edna Foa, who is the founder of um, uh, exposure-based therapy. Um, this therapy called um, COPE, or concurrent treatment with prolonged exposure. It's 12 sessions, manual guided, individual therapy. The first four sessions, just to give people some background so they wouldn't, if they wanted to relapse, they'd have tools, is CBT for substance use disorders, relapse prevention plus education, um, and then the last, the last seven sessions are exposure-based treatment. And we've actually been collaborating with all this group. So we have trials in Sweden, trials in Australia. Um, the VA has picked up um, our treatment. And um, these are just COPE studies today. As you can, to date, like three or four of them are, some of them are just case studies, three or four are um, um, randomized controlled trials, all of these, in all of these COPE showed superiority to a non-trauma-focused therapy. And now we're um, exploring it in MDMA-assisted COPE therapy and looking at oxytocin um, um, augmentation of, of COPE therapy. But I just wanted to show you, this is sort of an example. This is Sonia Norman's study of, you can see COPE is the blue line. This is their CAP score, Seeking Safety, which is, was again developed by someone here, Lisa Najibitz. Again, good therapy, you can see their, their symptoms are decreasing. But in, with COPE, you see a greater decrease in PTSD symptoms. Actually, both are co comparable in terms of percent days absent. Both did a pretty good job, about 60%. Uh, percent. So now let me go on to talk about one last really um, um, great treatment that's been developed that is really focused on women, developed by Shelley 
um, called the Women's Recovery Group. It was developed in through NIDA uh, funding, stage one and stage two. They have a very systematic method that you need to go through to prove um, that you, this therapy is effective. It's manual-based, relapse prevention. Um, it is good for women. Men have responded positively as well, but that it's women uh, who are really heterogeneous with respect to both their substance use, their um, co-occurring disorders, trauma history, and um, it is empirically supported and can be integrated into any of the any routine clinical care. So as, as a component of a, if you're if you're, someone's in an intensive outpatient or other um, type of treatment program. Um, and again, these are just results from the stage one and two clinical trials, uh, continued patterns of reduction in substance use, comparable effectiveness to standard mixed gender treatment. And I think what you find is that I, I think no matter what, if you're in a mixed gender treatment program, it is very important to have at least a group or two that are gender specific, because there are things that men will want to talk about with men, and there are certainly things that women are most comfortable talking about only with women. So uh, while I think mixed gender, single gender, a pro, as a treatment program, I think both can be effective, but I think if you have a mixed gender program, it is really important to have some gender specific components. And that's one thing, the Women's Recovery Group provides that um, very nicely. But if you look at, and again, Shelley did a wonderful review that was published in alcohol, Drug and Alcohol Dependence, Gender in and of itself is not a predictor of substance abuse treatment outcome. But there are a lot of things that, hap that are more common for women than men that are predictors of treatment outcome. Things like psychiatric comorbidity, family stressors, unemployment, underemployment. And so I think women can respond very well to treatment, but we really need to reduce those barriers that are unique to women in order for, and then we need to provide elements of treatment um, um, within the treatment program for things that, are, again, are uh, more common in women. So we really need to make sure we pay attention to child care, lack of resources, lack of transportation, significant use in others. That's one thing I forgot to mention. If you um, query men and women about how much substance use is going on in the home, you'll, the story is much more common for women that there's substance use in the home. For men, often it's their wife or the people in their home pushing them into treatment. But women, if they're going to go back to a place where there's substance use ongoing, it is, it's simply not going to work. So that's something you need to pay um, careful attention to. Also really important to focus on co-occurring disorders. We know that PTSD, depression, anxiety are all more common in women. And all of these things are predictors of poor outcome if they're not treated. Uh, parenting classes and certainly trauma-informed care are particularly important for women. And so with that, I think I'll stop just by saying there's important gender differences in prevalence, comorbidity, some etiologic relationships, neurobiology, and these gender differences really do have treatment implications that are true for both men and women. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. If people can wait for a microphone to come to you, if you have questions, anyone? Thanks, Kathleen. Um, terrific, as always. Uh, one question I have, and I don't know if, if there is data about this, but the study about that showed a lot of women that didn't enter treatment because of logistics, stigma, et cetera, yeah. was done before 2020 before there was telehealth. And I'm wondering True. the degree to which that might have changed or not since then, if there's any data about that. Um, that's a great question, and I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, unfortunately, because that, that uh, looked at national comorbidity, and the latest ones you can get, I, the latest numbers you can get are for, for um, now 2020, I think you can get. So national comorbidity, I mean, the, 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 health, the National Household Survey always lags behind by a couple of years. So I'm not sure if anybody has done anything um, to look at that. Shelley, do you know of anything? No. No, but that would be really interesting to. It's a great question, because what we do know, I was just looking at some data, is that the, num the percent of behavioral health 
um, appointments or services before the pandemic that was done by telehealth was 1%. Wow. Since the onset of the pandemic, it's 33%. It went up 32%. What we don't know is what the gender, we, we have no, I mean, I've never seen any data that indicates whether, you know, there's been a change or what, if there's a gender difference in that. But it's really an important, it's really important because um, the possibilities of, of extending treatment um, yeah. across multiple logistic barriers, you know, it really exists. So it's a great question, I think. It's a good study. Study, anybody? You know, it's a good study. Thank you so much, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I'm curious about your findings on some of the gender differences, both in um, sort of the neurobiological response to stress and, and also the response to guanfacine and, and clonidine. Do, do you think that there is some kind of sort of sex or gender difference in that process? Or do you think that women are just more likely than men to have that response to stress? Um. You know, I think, I'm, you know, that's a great question. What I didn't show you in, in, in our Yohimbian and some of our other studies, we actually do, do controls as well as the, as the cocaine dependent. So I think there is some, and I didn't show you, there, there, there's a few um, epigenetic studies done in animals that look at stress, um, um, the, the response to stress in male and female animals. And what they show is that there's more to, to this chronic sort of sub-threshold stress, I think is what they called it, um, um, in uh, male versus female mice. And then they look at female mice would get more depressed more quickly. And if they looked at the epigenetic changes, there was more in females than males. So I do, I think there's a vulnerability um, that, that women have. And if you, again, what I was saying, we looked at the Yohimbi. Now, women do have higher heart rate than men anyway, and it does tend to go up a little bit more um, in, in stress, in social stressors than men, um, but in the control group, it's not nearly as pronounced. So I think that substance use in some way um, hits, a, it hits a vulnerability for, for women. I think the stress... Um, those stress, those bi neurobiologic stress response systems are more sensitive, more sensitive to whatever it is, the epigenetic changes that then lead to um, that protracted um, um, vulnerability in women. I think, you know, I, I think it, there's, I think it is a process there that happens more in women than it does in men. And I think the substance use has something to do, I think the substance use is part of what it is that's producing those but both the substance use and trauma, and actually that's another slide. I, I will show it tomorrow. There's, I, I found this great slide. I don't know anything about. I just love epigenetics. I don't study it. I don't know. I read it, um, and I was. I, I found this great study, really recent, on telomere length, and they were looking at both stress and alcohol and people that had a lot of stress and a lot of alcohol and they actually found an additive effect in terms of telomere length and, and methylation. Um, um, so I, 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 and I think that, and they didn't do gender differences there. But so I think women are more sensitive in terms of whatever it is, that vulnerability that ends up causing them something that, that um, uh, last for, throughout their life to both traumatic stresses and and to the substances of abuse. Then I think the other bad news is they're more likely to have the kind of traumatic stress that leads to those changes that makes them more vulnerable. Thank you so much. So, so what about um, the role of oxytocin? Is there like? I know yeah. that people have been trying to figure out, was there a protective effect potentially, or where, where, where do we stand with what we it's know about such that? A, it's such a great area. It's such a, it was such a wonderful sort of promising story, wasn't it, that you thought. That, so we had one really uh, interesting study where we were looking at oxytocin in, um, okay, I'm just trying to think about the methodology because I didn't, did not show the, uh, oxytocin 
and uh, stress response in men and women with trauma. And what we found was there was, uh, it, it slightly dampened the stress response, um, a little bit more for, for women than men. But then when we sorted them by uh, level of trauma, those more severely traumatized, this is um, Julie, Julie Flanagan, who's now doing the um, Coke plus oxytocin. We found that it had its most profound effect in um, the, those with the most severe trauma. So in terms of actually decreasing, this is just a one-time dose um, uh, laboratory, human laboratory stressor. So we don't know about the treatment effect. So now Julie has tried to follow that out. In, but we, we then went on to, to look at oxytocin in uh, marijuana dependence. Actually more, you know, treatment, chronic treatment in uh, marijuana, um, cocaine and opiate dependence. Nothing, absolutely nothing. So I, you know, it's... Uh, uh, you know, I don't know what to say about it. I think if it has an effect, it's probably going to be mostly um, a corrective effect in people who have. And there are some studies when we found this fi this finding with severely traumatized. There are some studies where they looked at oxytocin receptors and and oxytocin levels, and um, it does look like childhood trauma does something later in life that decreases oxytocin and and changes receptor density and that sort of thing. So, uh, but across the board, I, you know, yeah, we have had a hard time finding consistent results. Thanks. I think we're all set, yep. right? So I just want to thank you for a wonderful talk, fantastic talk. And um, for those of us, those of you joining us tomorrow for Addictions in 2023, you're going to talk more about stress and, yes, and addiction. That's, that's so you'll be you know, providing much more detail on yeah. some of those things. So just one more round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you.